Welcome all. We're going to dig into 1 Peter's letter and uh, we'll start with prayer and then we'll, we'll start looking at some really interesting things. There's good stuff that Peter wrote to us, so we're going to check it out. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for this great grace that you have poured out on us. Grace meaning the favor that you've shown us again and again through Christ and through all the things that were opened up to us through Christ's sacrifice and resurrection from the dead. We praise you in Jesus' name. Guide us. Help us to understand. Amen. Alrighty. We're basically going to talk about 1 Peter 1, verses 3 through 5 today. But I want to start right from the beginning and read the first five verses. Here's what it says. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who reside as aliens, scattered throughout Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, who are chosen according to the foreknowledge of God the Father, by the sanctifying work of the Spirit, to obey Jesus Christ and be sprinkled with his blood, may grace and peace be yours in the fullest measure. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who, according to his great mercy, has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to obtain an inheritance which is imperishable and undefiled and will not fade away, reserved in heaven for you, who are protected by the power of God through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. And today what we're going to concentrate on is the security of your salvation. The fact that you can have absolute full confidence that it's not something that's going to fade or go away on you. So here's where we go. We'll begin with a little bit of introduction from what we talked about last week. It's Peter, the one who is sent, an apostle, one who is sent out. To the scattered pilgrims who are in the places that he mentioned, to the north and, and east of, of uh, Rome where he was, who are chosen of the Father, set apart by the Holy Spirit as holy, that's what sanctified means, who are saved by the blood applied by Jesus Christ, our high priest, in order to obey Jesus Messiah. It's important for us to understand that that's what we're called to do, is to obey him. We're not called to just put on a label and say, okay, now I'm called a Christian. We are commissioned to be obedient to him. If you look on uh, in, in chapter 1 and verse 14, it says, As obedient children... Do not be conformed to the former lusts which were yours in your ignorance. And then in uh, verse 22, it says, Since you have in obedience to the truth purified your souls for a sincere love of the brethren, fervently love one another from the heart. When it talks about us obeying the Lord Jesus, it's, it's a theme that has come right from the beginning. So many times we somehow get the impression that our Christianity, because it's not earned by works, then works have nothing to do with it. But the fact is, doing what God tells us to do, what the Lord Jesus told us we need to do, is important to the walk of faith. It's something that we're supposed to do. For example, in uh, John 14 and verse 15, John, is, John says, that quoting Jesus, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. And in 1 John chapter 3, and we're going to look at verses 18 to 24, it says, Little children, let us not love with word or with tongue, but in deed and in truth. We will know by this that we are of the truth and will assure our heart before him in whatever our heart condemns us. For God is greater than our heart and knows all things. It's interesting that John understands the struggle and the times in which we condemn ourselves. We say, I blew it. I, I, can't, I don't feel lifted and, and up in the Lord. He says, but if you're being obedient to what he said for you to do, it's going to assure you that you're on the right track. It says, beloved, if our heart does not condemn us, we have confidence before God. And whatever we ask, we receive from him because we keep his commandments and do the things that are pleasing in his sight. And it goes on to talk about it again. We do what he commands us in verse 23. The one who keeps his commandments in verse 24. In John witnessed and said, look, 
it's important to understand we do what we're called to do. So Peter says we're to be obedient and do it. John says it. James, in chapter 2, verses 14 to 17, says this. James 2, 14 to 17 says, What use is it, my brethren, if someone says he has faith, but he has no works? Can that faith save him? If all it is is a label, anybody can claim it, right? If a brother or sister is, in, is without clothing and in need of daily food, and one of you says to him, Go in peace, be warm, be full, and yet you do not give them what's necessary for their body, what use is that? Even so, faith, if it has no works, is dead, being by itself. What he's telling us is, faith requires us to do what God directs us to do. And if, as Christians, we fail to understand that, then we're missing out on what living the Christian life is for. What is it that Jesus says to do? He says, believe on him for salvation. It takes a doing, a believing, a commitment of self to do so. But then it goes on, that we keep what he says, we do what he directs us to do. So, let's go on in verses 3 through 5 in 1 Peter 1, where we're going to talk about our security. It says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. How do you and I bless God? God's the one with all the resources. He's the one that does the blessing. Is that not right? Well, blessed or blessed just means to praise or to honor. It means that someone is well spoken of. When they're blessed, you speak well of them. So it means to praise or speak well. And so we speak well of God the Father, and he's the Father of our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, the one to whom we have given our loyalty and our trust and to whose message we we work to have... Um, and, and have submitted ourselves to. So when it says, blessed be the God and Father of the Lord Jesus Christ, he's blessed in that we say things that are right about him. We lift him up. We speak well of him. He's the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who, according to his great mercy, has caused us to be born again. That's well worth speaking well of God, the Father who gave us that salvation. We're born again, it says, to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. I love the living hope. The word living is, a, is small, but it means so much. Um, we're told in Psalm 42, 1 and 2, we serve a living God. As opposed to all the other things that are followed and served that are not living and not God. In uh, Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12, it says that the word of God is living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword. When it says living, it means something that's not dead or not lifeless. It's something that's alive, active, powerful, and the word of God accomplishes things when it goes out. It is active in people's lives. It produces good results when it's applied in a life by faith. Living means to live, to breathe, to be among the living. It's active, it's blessed, it's powerful, it's effective. These things we know. Well, one of the terms that is really interesting is, is living water. And we're told about living water in the Word. When the Bible talks about living water or natural water, the Jews knew the need to wash often. They would make mikvahs, it was called. It means a gathering of the waters. And as a matter of fact, that's the word that is used in Genesis when it talks about God creating and gathering the waters into one place. He gathered, he made mikvah. He gathered the waters into one place. Well, when, when the Jews would make a place for ceremonial cleansing to wash because of instructions, they'd been healed from a disease they're supposed to wash. They're supposed to wash in preparation for worship. They're supposed to wash at certain times of the year for the ceremonial cleansing before Passover and before these things that they did. These mikvahs, these baptismal pools, were filled with water, and there were some specific things about them. The water could not be carried in buckets or pitchers. 
because that would be man supplying the water. It also could not be piped in a metal or a plastic pipe or a, a tube because that would be men directing it. It had to be filled from a spring or a well or rainwater. And if you fill them from those things, these were God-given waters. And so it was moving, clean, flowing water that God supplied. So when it talks about living water, it's very interesting because <clears throat> we know that Jesus, and it goes clear back into the Old Testament, used the, the phrase referring to living water for real specific things. In Jeremiah chapter 2 and verse 13, it says this. Jeremiah 2, verse 13 says this. For my people have committed two evils. They have forsaken me, the fountain of living waters, to hew for themselves cisterns, broken cisterns that can hold no water. Okay, so you have given up on fresh running water, and instead you have these collecting places, these, these cisterns, these, these places you've dug out, and they're lousy, they're cracked, so it does two things. One, it won't hold water. The other, it won't keep contaminants out. The breaks in it let junk come in, so you've got this nasty, stagnant puddles in the bottom of it. Nothing fresh, nothing good. He said, you've given up fresh water for that. And what he meant was, you're turning away from the living water, the life-giving water that God has, and substituting something of your own. He says, it's just as nasty as that nasty old cistern that won't hold the water as full of, full of crud. Or in John chapter 7, and this is one that, that you've heard many times, I'm sure, John chapter 7, and we're looking at verses 37 to 39, where Jesus said this, John 7, 37 to 39. Now on the last day, the great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried out, saying, If anyone is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. He who believes in me, as the scripture said, from his innermost being will flow rivers of living water. But this he spoke of the Spirit, whom those who believed in him were to receive. For the Spirit was not yet given, because Jesus was not yet glorified. And so John has given us that little commentary. But what Jesus was talking about was the Holy Spirit who, like living water, gives, gives freshness, gives healing, gives renewal, gives refreshing, gives cleansing, all the things that good, clean water can do. It's what the Holy Spirit does spiritually in us. And so when it says we have a living hope, through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. It's saying this is a lively thing. It's something that is not just, uh, you know, well, that's all good. It's saying it's in, in, it's in process of still doing, living, flowing, growing, refreshing, all these things that good water does. It's a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. And then he goes on and he talks about not just the living hope, but through the resurrection of Jesus Christ, this whole blessing of being born again and born into that living hope has to come through the resurrection. That's what causes it to be. We read about that in 1 Corinthians 15, and now Peter is saying the same. You notice that uh, we get into verses 4 and 5, that we're born again through his resurrection, and here's what we get out of it. There's something wonderful that comes. It says, to obtain an inheritance. Now, in Ephesians 1, it talks about this inheritance. If we look over at Ephesians chapter 1, verses 4 through 6, it says this. Just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we would be holy and blameless before him, in love, he predestined us to adoption as sons through Jesus Christ to himself, according to the kind intention of his will, to the praise of the glory of his grace, which he freely bestowed us, bestowed on us in the beloved. And then if you jump ahead to verses 11 through 14, it says, Also we have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to his purpose, who works all things after the counsel of his will, 
to the end that we who are first to hope in Christ would be to the praise of his glory. In him you also, after listening to the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation, having also believed you were sealed with him, in him, with the Holy Spirit of promise, who is given as a pledge of our inheritance, with a view to the redemption of God's own possession, to the praise of his glory. The inheritance means we've been brought into God's family, not only to belong to his family, but to inherit as children of God ourselves, who have a full place, just like Jesus does. As the Son of God, we are brought in and made a part of his inheritance. So we've been brought in to obtain an inheritance, and now listen to all the things about this inheritance. To obtain an inheritance, verse 4 says, which is imperishable, the word imperishable means beyond the reach of any change or decay. It tells us that our inheritance isn't going to decay away, isn't going to get old, isn't going to get cracked and broken. An inheritance which is imperishable and undefiled. Undefiled means it's unsoiled. It's free from anything that would change, deform, or bring, it, bring down its force bring down its vigor, change its nature. It's, it's undefiled. It, it, it can't happen to it. It's something that stays fresh all the time. And again, we're thinking about this living hope where the flowing and freshening is always coming from the, the water that moves. We're talking about an inheritance that stays fresh all the time. Then it goes on. It says not only is it imperishable and undefiled, it says it will not fade away. When it says it will not fade away, it means it will not quench. It won't fade out. It will never be like a flower that wilts and finally dies and, and goes away. That's not what it's like. It stays ever fresh, ever new. And then it goes on. Not only is it imperishable, undefiled, and won't fade away, it says it's reserved in heaven for you. The word reserved here means to take, take care of it carefully to keep it in view, to guard it, like someone who's intent that something not be disturbed. It means attend to carefully. Keep an eye on it. Hold it firmly so, so nothing fades away. Again, we have an, an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, won't fade away. Your reservation is secure. It's reserved in heaven for you. Who are protected by the power of God through faith, for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. The word protected means that you are constantly being guarded. It's like a garrison is assigned and you're their object of protection. They block every way of escape or every way of, of a way in. It's like when someone is under siege and they put up guards to make sure that nobody gets in that shouldn't. Providing protection is from an enemy. Security is ours when we put our all our matters into God's hands. In Philippians chapter 4, verses 6 and 7, it says this. Philippians 4, 6 and 7 says, To be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which passes all comprehension, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. The word guard there is exactly what Peter is saying. In verse 5, we're guarded, we're protected by the power of God. And when, it, when we're protected, it means that he has placed a watch on us that keeps us secure. And then it says, we're protected by the power of God through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed at the last time. And that is something that's kind of fun too. To be ready to be revealed means ready means kept handy, prepared to be quickly revealed. And the word revealed means to throw the cover off of something, to show what was hidden. In Matthew 24, 44, the Lord Jesus was talking to them about being ready for the end, for Christ to come back. And he was talking about them being alert, ready to act quickly. And he uses an example. He says, if the homeowner had known when a thief was coming into the house, then he would have been on guard, prepared, ready for the thief. 
Oh, in the same word, that's the exact same word. Ready, there is the same thing for being ready for the revelation. There is a big reveal that is coming. There is a reveal that's going to come and be an exciting thing. And if we get to be a part of it, if we are there because of faith and trust in the Lord, because he has kept us with an imperishable, undefiled, unfading reservation in heaven, we are protected by the power of God for this big reveal. Our takeaway from this instruction is this. God has securely made sure that our inheritance that he has given to us in Christ Jesus is going to be there when the big reveal comes. Look at 1 Peter 4, verse 13. In 1 Peter 4, 13 it says, But to the degree that you share the sufferings of Christ, keep on rejoicing, so that also at the revelation of his glory, you may rejoice with exultation. And look at chapter 5 and verse 1. Therefore I exhort the elders among you as your fellow elder and witness of the sufferings of Christ and a partaker also of the glory that is to be revealed. And he goes on to say, shepherd the flock of God. What, he, what Peter is telling us is there is an exciting revealing that is going to happen. The cover is going to be jerked away. And just like the master magician shows you something that, you know, you couldn't believe it. God has something that will make every human magician look like a piker. He has got a revelation coming, a blessing in which he's going to reveal all that salvation has done for you that we don't see now. We enjoy fellowship with God. We enjoy, enjoy fellowship through his Holy Spirit. We enjoy fellowship with other believers. These things are good. We know the promises of God. And in faith, we believe that these promises are absolutely sure. They will come to be. Wonderful thing. We have peace with God as we roll our anxieties off on him. And he takes those cares, those fears, and instead assures us of his constant care and love for us. Good thing. But do you realize that's barely the beginning of, of all that God has prepared for us. That's like you walk into the house and you smell the very first whiff that someone's baking fresh bread. Or that you get up in the morning and you're dragging through and suddenly, ah, oh, the smell of fresh coffee. Or the very first of the good things that are coming. We haven't had the real thing yet. We've only got the down payment of what will come. So God's big reveal is going to be glorious. And if we're in Christ, we get to be ready for that. Be a part of that. Are you ready? Are you expectant of the good things that will be revealed when God sends his son to get us once and for all? This is what Peter's talking about. Your salvation, what we have in Christ Jesus, is imperishable, undefiled, won't fade away, reserved for you, where it's protected by the power of God, it's a salvation ready to be revealed, verses 4 and 5 there. This is good news. There is no reason, if you are a true believer in Jesus Christ, to ever think that somehow he let it slip or he let it fade away or the promises don't matter anymore. Everything is continually freshened. This is a living hope that continues to be renewed constantly. Are you ready for the big reveal? It's going to be glorious. Let's pray. Lord, this, your word, is good. It's encouraging. And I don't feel like I do justice in, in trying to present how grand it's going to be. But Lord, by your spirit, carry your words. Build up in us a, an appreciation, a uh, expectation of the blessing to be revealed. Thank you. Now guide us and help us not to lose sight of that or lose the sense of that as we 
go into the battle. We're in a rough time. The world does not follow you. Many don't know you at all. And some of the things we deal with are going to be tough, whether it's health challenges, family challenges, personal struggles that we're in. These things are here. Help us to remember that we're part of God's big reveal, that he's going to throw off the covers, throw off the junk that drags us down now and gives us that blessing of the fulfilling of all the promises that we're holding on to now. These things we say with thanksgiving. Praise God. In Christ Jesus' name, amen. There's a lot to look forward to. I don't know how long it's going to be. Jesus could come tomorrow evening. Jesus could come 10 years from now. I don't know. There's signs that seem to indicate it's closer than we ever could think. And be ready. The revelation's coming. We will see all of it revealed one day. Hold on. Don't give up. Keep going after God with all you got. We'll see you next time.